Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue the nations before him and strip kings of their robes, to open the doors before him, and the gates shall not be closed. I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you treasures of darkness and riches hidden in secret places so that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I surname you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I arm you, though you do not know me, so that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is no one besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I, the Lord, do all these things. Shower, O heavens, from above, and let the skies rain down righteousness. Let the earth open, that salvation may spring up, and let it cause righteousness to sprout up also. I, the Lord, have created it. How are y'all doing this morning? Really? All right, there we go. All right, <laughs> we're awake. It's good. It's good to see you here this morning as we continue um, our newness journey this fall of Behold, I Make All Things New. We're focusing on this scripture that comes actually from the book of Revelation. It comes at a part in Revelation when we are getting a vision of the new kingdom which God is bringing forth. And God is seated on the throne and says, Behold, I make all things new. And unfortunately, I think when we often read the book of Revelation, we think about it like, oh, that's when, you know, Jesus is going to return, or maybe that's when we die and go to heaven that that's going to happen. But that these words are true for us today. That God is here, even now, making things new, and calling us to behold the great and new things that he's doing, even in our midst. And so we're focusing on this scripture and this idea of newness and discovering the new things that God is doing with us and among us. And we began our journey with renewal and recommitment. And over the last few weeks, Pastor Scott and Sarah have talked to us about God's renewal and how that begins in the waters of baptism and continues throughout our lives as we are washed in these waters, claimed as God's children, and continue on this journey of faith, being renewed by him as we gather together to hear his word and to share in his supper. Renewed and restored to go back out and to do the work to which he has called us. And last week we had a big wedding celebration here where we filled out our recommitment cards, making that step as a community to say yes to God and to acknowledge this renewal and this love that God has for us and to commit ourselves to being a part of that work to which he has called us. And I'll still invite you, if you haven't seen one of these or if you still have one of these and you haven't filled it out, to please do so. We've got a box in the back that you can put them in or you can put them in an offering box or bring them to the office. We're gonna talk about these a little bit later this morning. Of what it means to recommit ourselves to the mission and ministry that God has called us and claimed us to do. And so as we move forward now, having done this recommitment, we turn slightly in this theme of newness to a new reformation. As many of you may or may not know, um, about this time of year, the church celebrates Reformation Sunday. We'll be doing that in a couple weeks. Um, it's usually close to October 31st, which is the day that the Protestant Reformation supposedly kicked off when Martin Luther nailed his 95 theses to the door of the church back in 1517 and kind of spurred the Protestant Reformation, be, you know, birthed to Lutheranism, which obviously we're now a part of. And so the church always kind of looks back on this time and reflects on that and, you know, the Protestant Reformation and what that has meant for us as a church. But sometimes I think we forget to truly live into what Luther was talking about. That there wasn't just a one-time Reformation and that's it. Luther actually talked about how the church needs to constantly be renewing and reforming itself. And if you think about it, everything that is alive does this, right? 
There's constantly, you have to be renewed, you have to change, you have to grow, you have to evolve. If you're alive, you're not stagnant. And this church is the living body of Christ. And so we too have got to be reforming and renewing ourselves. Through gathering together, through hearing God's word and sharing in his supper, we are renewed but constantly reformed, that we are never done with this journey. And so to start us off, kind of shifting our focus here, we begin with words from Isaiah. I want to give you a little background to what we talked about, because we're going to explore this text this morning and what it might mean for us today as God's renewed and reforming church. But this passage from Isaiah is words that were directed to the people of Israel when they were in exile. Their kingdom had been conquered and overthrown by the Babylonians, and they had been sent into exile. Kind of seemed like that was the end of their, you know, kind of time of glory as as this kingdom of Israel and Judah. That was done. They'd been conquered. They'd been exiled. But then God brings a word to them, even in kind of that low moment. And it's kind of an interesting word. I think, because it's not actually written kind of to or about them. I mean, maybe it's written for them to overhear. But do you remember when we heard this text from up in the balcony, who God was speaking about? Do you remember? There's a clue. God says to Cyrus, to my anointed, who is Cyrus? I guess I gave you a little clue, didn't I? You know, it's kind of interesting. I googled Cyrus. Guess what I found? Miley Cyrus, yeah. I actually had to put Cyrus Persia to get kind of a picture of this. This This is the king of Persia. This is not an Israelite. This is not one of God's chosen holy people. And God is writing this message about this man because God is going to use him to free his people. This guy is going to conquer Babylon and many other ancient empires in that region. He's going to form the Persian Empire, and he's going to make the call that the Israelites can return to their homeland. He is going to free these exiles, and he is not one of God's people. It says in the text that we heard, I surname you, I call you, though you do not know me. He is not part of the church. He does not worship God. He doesn't even probably know who God is. But God chooses him to do his work. And I think this is helpful for us to keep in mind because I think sometimes we can be the Cyrus and sometimes we can be the Israelites. That God will call and claim and choose people that aren't part of the fold to do his work and to acknowledge that maybe sometimes that's us. I mean, yes, we're all here, we're all gathered in community, but sometimes that may feel like that's not us. I'm not holy. I'm not good enough. I am not the right person for that job. God says you are. Or on the flip side, maybe we're the Israelites that need to hear, hey, guess what? God's going to use someone that ain't part of you to do my work. And for us to know that God works in this way and that God may choose people and call people that we don't really like, that we don't think are qualified to do his work. That God is the God of all people, regardless of who they are, where they came from, what their status is. And he calls us and he claims us and anoints us right there. In that font with those waters, that that's where this starts. And as Lutherans, right, we do this before people can, we do this for children, people that can't even know God, just like Cyrus didn't know God, that we are called and chosen, and then we come to know God. That God will call us and choose us to do his work regardless of what we think, regardless of where we've been, regardless of what we've done. 
It's in those waters that this journey begins, that God calls us to do his work, the work that he has in store for us. And let's hear a little bit more about how that might work. Woe to you who strive with your maker, earthen vessels with the potter. Does the clay say to the one who fashions it, what are you making, or your work has no handles? Woe to anyone who says to a father, what are you begetting, or to a woman, with what are you in labor? Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel and its maker, will you question me about my children or command me concerning the work of my hands? I made the earth and created humankind upon it. It was my hands that stretched out to the heavens, and I commanded all their host. I have aroused Cyrus in righteousness, and I will make all his paths straight. He shall build my city and set my exiles free, not for price or reward, says the Lord of hosts. Woe to you who strive with your maker. This next part is actually kind of one of the most interesting to me, and I think the one of the most challenging, and maybe one of these new reformations that we need to have. God calls us in the waters of baptism, claims us as his children, but does he leave what we're going to do up to us? Doesn't sound like it, right? Who are you to tell me what I'm gonna do, what my work is gonna be? what my church is going to be about. I am the Lord, not you. I think sometimes we get this mixed up a little bit in our heads and we want to make it about us, right? And what we want the church to do. And maybe we'll even say to God, I'll help you out, I'll do what you want when it's convenient for me. And we forget that God is the one that sets the rules, that sets the agenda, that determines what this work that he has called us to do is going to be. And that he is God and we are not. And that we are called to be used by him, not to tell him how he's going to use us. I read a quote this week that I wanted to share with you because it really stirred this for me and challenged me even to think about my own relationship with God and how I see Jesus working in my life. Because we know that this work of God is to love us and to care for us and to help us in our times of need. But is it about us, or is it about God? This man named Stephen Long said, does Jesus help me because he is the son of God, or is he the son of God because he helps me? I'll say that again. Does Jesus help me because he's the son of God? Or is he the son of God because he helps me? Do we get that order mixed up sometimes? Does Jesus become God because he does what we want or is he God and therefore he cares for us? I think this Isaiah text is kind of calling us to renew our minds to remind ourselves that this is God's church. This is God's show. He is the Lord, we are not and that we are called to love and serve him with the kind of love and service which he first showed us. Because this is the work that he does. In this passage, we read about how he's going to use this man Cyrus to set these captives free, these literal Israelites that are in bondage in Babylon, and Babylon, they're gonna be brought back. But this is still the work that God continues to do today. This is who God is, setting people free. This is the work that Christ did on the cross to set us free from those kinds of exiles and bondage, addiction, abuse, despair, hunger, homelessness, fear. God sets us free. That is God's work. That is the work that God has called us to do, to go into those places of hurting and exile and despair and to bring his hope, and to bring his life, and his promise. That there is a God that is greater than all of those things, and that he can do new things. He can bring new life and new hope, even into those moments of despair. 
This is the work of God. This is what he has called us to do, and this is what we will do. He has anointed us and chosen us in those waters of baptism, and this is why we're here. This is what we're doing. 